It's turning the wheel, go live. Uh, okay, go live anyway. Remove LinkedIn, LinkedIn doesn't want, so uh, <laughs> save changes. Okay, so we are live now. Uh, I'm really happy to meet some of my good friends over the years uh, from the bioemulation group. Uh, I was really happy to meet you or join, join the group and share some uh, valuable information over the last years, not only on colors, the topic we're talking about today. And uh, I'm talking about an article uh, I will show you the eLab 8, a new approach to digital shade matching. So digital shade matching is, uh, is, 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 a, is a hot topic. It's interesting that it's a hot topic in literature, but at the end, uh, most of the dentists select A3 or, or uh, something uh, just, uh, yeah, some uniform shades. But uh, this, is, this is a topic I, I think we have to talk about. And I liked very much the approach of this article to try to get away from just the holding and working around with shade tabs and trying to find a color match or the other way that uh, I was involved uh, many years ago with digital shade taking. And this also never really worked out to work uh, the way the dentist and the lab technician wanted. So this approach is very interesting and um, Let's jump into this uh, discussion. Uh, I welcome Javier, Sasha, and Panos. Uh, I'm glad to have you here uh, in this, in this uh, show or in this live event. And let's jump right into the first questions I always ask to any author, if you would have to write this article again. So this article was published in 2017. You wrote it in, in 2016. So what would you change if you had to rewrite it, Sasha? Uh, in all honesty, I wouldn't change very much at all. It was, um, you know, it was up to date at the time and it was uh, submitted for publication and a lot has changed since then. Um, but it, it was, at the time, it wasn't just only a uh, concept article. We have been clinically testing the eLab protocol for a whole year already. Um, and it outlined the, the basic fundamental principle, I guess, of uh, photocolorimetric um, measurement using digital cameras and, you know, the recipe formulation of patient personal shape recipes and stuff. So the way that this basically all started was that um, Javier and, and Panos and myself, uh, we had a conversation about this kind of approach. I look back and I think it was around 2011 is actually the first time um, when we guys spoke about it. And then um, I knew very little about this topic. I was still uh, in, in Western Australia at the time at Moen Dental Lab there. Um, but I was confronted with the problem of reliable single central shape matching uh, simply because Australia is predominantly a single crown market. And the majority of my clients were prosthodontists and other referral based practices. So I had to do a lot of single center restorations and I was really quite frustrated with um, the lack of prediction and the lack of certainty of getting this right. And so, you know, Panos. Among the three of us, Panos is the guy that has just the tremendous uh, knowledge about the literature and his, his amazing Jedi ways of researching the literature and stuff. And it's always amazing what papers he has and pulls out from all sorts of fields, not just dentistry. And so Panos knew a lot about this. And, you know, Javier is, you know, he's the computer geek and he knows a lot about the technical side of things, the cameras and RGB color space and all of this. And so you guys, uh, you guys presented me with... Um, actually a, a prototype version of, I guess, you know, what we wanted to achieve back then. It was based on some pre-existing protocols uh, and ideas already because, you know, you never really invent anything fundamentally new. You just, you know, make the wheels spin faster and add your own bits and pieces to it. So maybe you guys can tell us a little bit about, you know, how you had, had hatched this idea of actually, t you know, imagining to take dental photography to this next level of quantification. How did that, how did you guys actually, you know, how did that come about? Thanos. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you, Alessandro, for uh, and Dennis Camera TV. I think this is a fantastic initiative. Uh, the, the, the showcasing articles uh, from the past uh, through the IJED and uh, giving the opportunity to the public uh, to be able to interview the, uh, the authors is a fantastic idea. I hope. Uh, this continues in the future, and I, I just want to thank you sincerely for uh, having us uh, be part of this. Um, with regards to the question, 
and continuing from where Sasha left out, indeed, this, this has been a concept that Javier and myself, in 2011, I was still a general practitioner, and I was very ardent about uh, shade estimation and matching. And um, when, when we formed the bioemulation uh, group in the society with Javi and Gianfranco, uh, we were trying to tackle some, 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 some um, problems that had persisted uh, within the dental literature. And one was shade estimation, evaluation, and objectivity. And um, it was a culmination at the time. And again, as Sasha mentioned, the, these are uh, ideas that have existed out in the literature. We just tried to refine them. We didn't try to do something else. We were optimizing. And um, I'm very blessed and fortunate to be part uh, of this group and in, in the company of amazing and brilliant minds, as, as Sasha mentioned, uh, Javi had uh, always a technical advantage on us. He, he could understand um, the, 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 the photonics behind the sensors. Uh, he could integrate new technologies. Cross polarization was 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 beginning to become a fad at the time. Uh, gray cards from the past were were being uh, used more consistently for uh, objective uh, shade estimations. And it was actually, if 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 I were to 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 uh, put a father on this whole project, it was Javi who was pushing us, Sasha and myself, that oh we can do this, guys, we can do this, and and we nearly abandoned this project three times. It, it was we were just running into into. <laughs> And that was because the, the German said the German said it will never work. I was the guy who said it will never work. <laughs> I think Javi should take the story uh, and unravel it because it was a case of Javi and Sasha that validated this concept. The case that took I don't Javi how how long did this case take? Remember? Yeah, it, it took some time. It's uh, again, well, I I would like to also thank uh, Alessandro for this opportunity. I think it's a fantastic initiative, as Pano said. So uh, indeed, it was a very interesting thing, and and I believe that it was it was in uh, in Greece when Panos uh, gave me the first prototype of of, uh, of the polarize, and then we started taking pictures. That uh, I was already working with uh, with white balance cards and and other things in photography before, and with the raw files. And, and trying to calibrate my pictures to have always a more uniform color with, between my, my dental photography pictures and, and, and not, not only dental. And, uh, and then I told Panos, look, uh, all, the, all the, um, the trials, all the, the tests before uh, trying to measure color with photography were fundamentally had some issues because of all the specular reflection component that, that might contaminate the uh, the, the the measurements and and actually the polarize was actually instantly removing this problem right so so I told him immediately dude if if we try if we put together the polarize with a white balance card and and with a known value of luminosity we can start calibrating pictures and 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 really getting exactly the same colors every time and and that will allow us us to to start measuring color. So that was the principle. So I made some tests with my cameras, and then uh, we we started also the discussion with with Sasha how we need to test this and try to validate the working on the distance. So we start with that famous case for the article, which which took really a lot of time to to do because we we actually even needed to develop a new white balance card uh, in in the in the time because we had issues with the uh, with existing cards it was they were supposed to be certified but but then we we had some issues then one day we we put next to each other the the cards and and we found out they were different so that that's where the, the source of our issues were so yeah it took it took time until until we managed to to do it but uh but i really remember all these conversations and it was so exciting you know when when everything was fitting and then it was writing messages like eh, now it works it works fantastic and uh, and really that was a fantastic experience and 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 then the sasha was thinking about the possibilities of mixing and came up also with the idea of, of uh, mixing with uh, the lab with the pigments and that was really brilliant and, yeah. and then that's that's the beginning of, of the so this this brings me just to a, a question that for you guys might be very basic but uh, the question <laughs> what is what is this cie ill lab uh, all about because uh, it's in the title of the of the publication it's uh, it's in a lot of articles it's on the internet but just just a short a short comment or a short information for people to understand 
what what this what this uh, what these numbers or these letters uh, stand for and what what it's all about because it's based on this uh, is also because it's always elab prime uh, we will talk about this later but what is elab all about sasha so the the, the c lab or the lab is a is a color appearance model um and uh, the, the, this particular color appearance model was introduced by the CE, which is a commission that is dedicated to uh, standard, standards and color science. And this one was introduced in 1976. And the purpose of it was that you could actually quantify color differences with it, which wasn't readily uh, in, uh, possible with other uh, precursor um, uh, color appearance model like the XYZ model. So basically, it's a mathematical color appearance model it's fundamentally uh, what we would call a Cartesian coordinate system and what we can describe with the uh, lab values is we can determine what the luminosity is of a target tooth color which is expressed along the l-axis uh, what the amount of red or magenta is in a tooth color which is expressed along the a-axis and what the amount of yellow is in a tooth color which is expressed along the b-axis so with these three coordinates, how much brightness, how much red, and how much yellow, it is possible to describe pretty much any tooth color of the entire natural uh, color space with just three numeric numbers. And this presented a radical shift um, in, in comparison to existing uh, shading models, the established models in dentistry, which is, of course, based on stock shade guides in the Vita system and so forth. Um, so there was a radical departure from that instead of using the established shading regimes to switch over to a numerical system. And this was in fact one of the, I mean, we, we're not of course the first ones who have had this idea, but um, you know, I, I thought from the beginning that this was gonna be a protocol for dental technicians, uh, given my own background. And so I was very skeptical at the beginning whether you could um, break these ideas uh, you know, of expressing tooth colors numerically with three numbers to dental technicians who have been more you know, artistically inclined and that kind of thing, you know. Um, so I was, I, was quite, I was quite skeptical whether that could be done this way. But I think we managed to explain this in a very logical and, and, and understandable way. Um, and it, it, I think the first time I presented about this, um, and Panos, I think this might have been in Terrania, right? This was in, you know, this was in California, right? That was the first time we presented about it, right? And um, I think they had no idea what we were talking about, right? <laughs> I think they didn't know, they didn't really, it, it took a long time uh, to sink in. It, it really took a long time and a, and a lot of practical examples um, to show what you could do with this. So when I when I took this protocol over from uh, what Javier and, and Panos had worked out on, the, the two persistent problems that we had at the time was that you could only do this protocol with one camera. It had to be like your camera. And there was even problems like if you took your camera and you took a picture of the same thing in a different room, the numbers wouldn't match up, right? So one of the challenges that I dealt with was the synchronization between different cameras, right? But then to make this a usable concept that was easy to communicate and that technicians could use practically um, to make restorations. And at that time, when we published this article, this was the archetypal form of it. So we still used um, the visualized liquid you know, you get color recipes and you could immediately check and so forth. And, you know, it would work well in my hands, but not if you explain this new to someone else. You know, they couldn't really do anything with it. So from there on, I mean, ever since this article was published um, and it worked, we could document this with a, uh, you know, a fair few of clinical cases that we did also with Marco Bresnik, who's also a member of the Biomulation Group. From there on, it was a matter of simplification. It was a matter of trying to break down the complexity of its components and trying to make it simpler and simpler and simpler and to reduce the entrance barriers further and further and further. That's pretty much what we have been up to since then. Yeah, because I had, I had a lot of feedbacks uh, after this article was published and um, most of people were like, oops, uh, is, this, uh, is this just something for uh, some special guys or uh, can I use that in my office or in my lab or in my communication protocol so there were a lot of, uh, of quest big question marks around and uh, because if, if you look at conventional shade taking uh, most of the systems are like value based so uh, all, all these shade guides are I'm talking about 3D master or the, 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 the latest shade guides from Vita uh, or also composite shade guides or composite materials are trying to reduce the the numbers of uh, of steps 
and and focusing more on 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 lightness on the value and 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 saying okay if it's a little bit red or a little bit green or a little bit yellow uh, we don't care we don't see it anyway so what brought you to integrate this a b also in the in the equation and i think this brings us to the next question what is elab prime uh, so i think this was then the next step to 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 get this prototype working uh in a more reliable way with more cameras with uh, make it easier to use for for the average dentist or the average lab technician can you tell me more about i don't know sasha or yeah, so the 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 initial idea i mean the, the whole purpose of elab prime was simplification through automation so you could do the original elab protocol the way that it was described in the article either with uh, photoshop or you could do it with um adobe lightroom but you, you, you had to accustom yourself with this, right? It wasn't self-explanatory. I mean, Lightroom is a pretty complex software, Photoshop even more so. Um, you could do it with Bridge as well. I think Harvey did it with Bridge for a while. Um, it was just basically, you know, to, to, to reduce entrance barriers and to make this more readily available for a larger portion of the general population, it was necessary to have a standalone software that, take, that would take care of the entire calibration process, the cross-synchronization process, and then that was the initial plan. But, and then as we got into it, you know, I mean, nowadays, you know, with machine learning algorithms and everything that, that is available and possible today, you know, this open, you know, completely new doors and portals to a lot of opportunities that were previously unimagined. And this still continues until today. It hasn't finished there. So with all the future projects that are coming up now that we're, you know, have, that we have developed now, it's, it's still mind boggling what you can do today. So we're, we're also very blessed to live in times like these to have access to such technology. So this leads to the next question. So when I was looking into it and I also downloaded the Elab Prime uh, app you have developed uh, as a dentist, I, I found it to be more a, a dental technician thing than a dentist thing. So, so this is a question that might be uh, summarizing some other questions that have been uh, posted. Is this, is this something that is just for indirect restoration? So the communication between dentist and lab to do single single anterior crowns? Or do you see a, a potential also for helping the dentist? So for example, if I'm doing CAT cam restoration or if I'm doing extensive composite restoration, might be a potential use of this software also in this field. So, uh, so that's, that's not only the high skilled lab technician with his uh, with his dentist using this so that it might be something for for everybody definitely yeah. uh, future, future developments are, are definitely aimed into the bridging the technical and clinical realms and um, it, it, for participants who have uh, actually made it to some of the e-lab uh, symposiums uh, either in manchester or marseille we have uh, clearly indicated that our intentions are to include the clinicians in, in this part. Now, is it going to be the same software? Is it going to be a, a spin-off version? Uh, all the possibilities are uh, lie ahead of us, but uh, for sure, the future lies into, into resins and in, into high density polymers. Uh, we're we're um, very keen on uh, working uh, along the industry and creating uh, databases for conventional uh, resin systems for the direct and the indirect technique uh, and the CAD CAM, but this, this, this is definitely going to develop. Uh, I can say that maybe Corona slowed us down uh, by a couple months, but um, you know, in the near future, we're going to have uh, further developments and maybe Javi wants to uh, discuss a little bit among it because uh, Javi's uh, very well known for his uh, composite skills, so uh, it's his favorite material too, so uh, you, you can see. I think that uh, well, we're talking about color measurement, and of course, color measurement is is uh, it's an it's a big advantage, right? At the moment, you start you stop like just guessing uh, visually, and and you start measuring color, you you win a lot of precision with in ever with, with anything that you do, right? Because you 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 move from a subjective uh, um, process to an objective process. And that's actually a big advantage. And, and one of the things that I'm, I just realized, because I've seen a lot of lectures during this confinement and the, and the corona, there was a lot of online events. And uh, the norm and what is very interesting is that now everybody speaks about measuring color. 
So suddenly, uh, a lot of people you can you can see them lecturing about how to measure color here, there, and they are using measurement of color. Maybe it's just a spectrophotometer or it's a, the camera. They are using ELAP, but the the thing is that they are realizing that that really this is a big advantage. If we start measuring color, this is a big advantage. And uh, and the thing is, of course, then that when we we tackle the problem of of um, uh, materials that have a, a specific shade. So you actually cannot customize those shades like you can do with the, with the ceramics because mixing ceramics powders it gives you the, the, the absolute freedom of creating the exact color of the patient, which is something we, we, we actually cannot have in, in resins because we cannot really mix the color of resins manually like that. So we will have a lot of issues added if we start mixing uh, with pigments and stuff. So, uh, so basically, we need to change a little bit the manner, but we need to we need to try to approximate to, to the existing colors and the existing database, as Pana said, of, of different uh, shades and combinations. That, of course, the, the underlying problem is that there are so many materials and so many different brands, and even inside the brands, the colors are so different. Then it becomes really a, a, a epic, absolutely epic um, task, uh, impossible task to, to really have a database of everything that is existing. So we are thinking about solutions for that, of course, and, and, and I think that you should stay tuned for, for the future, for, for the news that, that we have, we are preparing for sure, but but I think it's it's a very interesting topic. And, uh, and that leads me to, to another thing that probably if we want to increase the accuracy of our composites, our uh, monolithic restorations, and so on. What we need to start thinking is about changing the color model a little bit. Okay, so start start thinking that the colors that that uh, we are using as a standard colors are probably not as good as as they should be, because we need to customize them a lot. We always need to combine with the stains, with uh, recipes, with a lot of things in order to get the right colors. Or something that is very close, and that that gives me the idea that of course there is there is something else that we need to to push. I mean, it's not only about color measuring, but I, I really believe that we need to start thinking about changing the color reference, the color models, and that's also something we are working on in the future for sure. Interesting, very interesting. So uh, <clears throat> another another Panos, question. Your mic is, is turned off. Yeah, I think Panos wants to no, say no, because something. I, I muted Panos because he has this double sound. So uh, ah, okay, okay. I, I turn him on because you have to lower down the volume of your of your loudspeaker. Is that so you don't have this double sound. Uh, I'd like oh, to introduce here. Panos. Okay. Here and Panos. Okay. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Javier. This is interesting, and I know that. Um, the composite issue and the discussion about shade matching or shade integration or, or integration of the, the materials into the natural tissues is, uh, is a big deal and composites are getting more and more important. Uh, ceramics uh, looks easier because we have more mixing possibilities. It's like cooking. If you cook with composites, you have um, only a few of uh, ingredients available and with ceramics, you have a lot of ingredients. It might, that makes it also sometimes too complicated to cook with ceramics rather than cooking with composite materials. But one question that arose also about going back to the ELAP Prime software or technology, what do we need? So we, you talked about gray cards and uh, DSLR cameras. Uh, cross polarization, so it looks very technical, very uh, equipment uh, equipment uh, uh, consuming. So what about what about new developments like smartphones? A lot of people is taking pictures with smartphones. I'm not a big fan of this, but this is a reality that most dentists are picking up their smartphones and communicating with the lab with the shade match, shade tab, and taking a picture with the smartphone. So. Is there any 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 idea or concept to develop this technology or make it easier to access uh, without shooting raw files uh, using JPEGs and uh, and and your smartphone, Sasha? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay, this is this is uh, how do you say in Greek? This is Sibyllic. 
Uh, this is, uh, he didn't say anything, but he didn't say, he, you say yeah. a lot. No, that, uh, no, the question was because we had several questions from people uh, telling us, do you think we need, we, we can manage uh, shape matching just using JPEGs? What, how, how much information do we need from the picture that the software can get some information, transform some, some information? Because you always find software that you put in something and it, and it gives out something, but you don't know if this is reality or this is true. And you believe what the software is telling me is uh, what I have to do. So, um, so I think um, just just a, a, a thing on on the future. So two things: Do you think uh, Elab Prime will be available for for dentists? So uh, as myself to use it in a daily workflow to just help help them to get better directions where to go with their material selection or anything. Uh, or do we, do you think it will be something more sophisticated for the high end for the high end dentist to uh, to get the perfect shade match? Right. Okay. So um, uh, I, I can't say this. So I mean, uh, you know, the, this whole JPEG debate is a is a is a question of technicality. You know, so I, I think it really is relevant. I mean, JPEGs won't work because you cannot. Uh, synchronize different cameras with each other when you when you go down the JPEG path, and that's not really an important rather than question because I guess what you really want to know is there are ways of making it easier, mm. whether this is JPEG or not is besides the point. Right? It's it's about the process that is implied and whether that is able to make uh, anything easier uh, for users and, and make it more easy for them to get into this kind of technology. Right? And as far as uh, smartphone photography is concerned, um, I mean obviously we're being asked this question quite a lot and. You know, many. You know, when you're not, when you're not deeply into this development process, it seems like a no-brainer, obviously pretty simple idea of why not do this with a smartphone, right? And I think the thing with that is, um, you know, I think smartphones and their applications have become such an everyday part of our lives, right? Uh, there's a smartphone app for everything, uh, you know, for finance, you know, for uh, finding a partner, for all sorts of things, right? And, and they're all very easy to use, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to make apps. That's a bit of a fallacy. Just because something's easy to use doesn't mean it's easy to make. Um, and you know, we often forget that there is a whole Silicon Valley full of the smartest people in the world that put all their brain power into making such apps and above all to make them easy. Okay, so the first thing that is noteworthy is that it's 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 not an easy trick to pull off. And many people have already tried this in the past with launching smartphone apps for the purpose of some sort of color quantification, and they have all faded off into obscurity. And so this is not easily done, okay? Um, is it impossible? No, it's not impossible. Um, are we going to have something? Possibly. <laughs> okay, no, no, but it's just because this was a question asked and you, you, you repeated it. This is a question you hear all over the place. Uh, sure, sure. It's, it's like yeah, everyone is part, looking for the magic for the magic tool. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as far uh, as the other part of the question is concerned, I mean, Elab has always started. You know, it was always important from the beginning that it was a tool to improve the communication between the dental office and the dental lab. It was from the beginning about objective shape quantification and communication. It's a it's a it's a community tool. Elab has, has, has evolved to become a community project with such a large you know, group on Facebook of 13,000 members and so forth. So it has always been in our interest to make this technology also available for the clinician um, based on the experience that we have collected with Elab and Elab Prime over the last two years. So that you finally have something that makes it easy for clinicians to get into this technology as well as easy as possible without many gadgets, without huge investment, um, without uh, technical proficiency or anything like that. And, you know, the, the, the three of us, we've always worked together on joint projects like this. And, you know, I, I will say that we have fairly amazing developments coming up this year. Sounds very interesting. Sounds very interesting. Uh, so, I want to interject. Yeah. You know, if you look at the etymology of the elaborate aid, it, it's there to aid, as 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 Sasha very well uh, pointed out. It's it's a tool to help. Let's not forget 
that, that we require high, high skill and high training. And we are not here to replace that. We are here to improve upon that skill. Uh, basic skills and fundamentals need to be commanded by the end user already. Um, and furthermore, this particular tool, eLab, can help them even get a little bit more down the path. But um, it's it's not trying to create a miracle uh, out of <laughs> the, the cure. Of this. <laughs> this is not a panacea in any sense. Um, you need to you need to apply the effort and understand the fundamentals. That's why education is a, a big component of uh, the eLab system. And uh, educational courses are offered uh, worldwide for, from uh, either Sasha, Javi, myself. Um, we have certified technicians who are doing this, our, our partners, our collaborators. In the future, we're gonna see certified dentists uh, being involved in education, which we strongly as a group believe um, that we need to create a, 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 an intrinsic support. That's why we have the group. And uh, we urge everybody who's interested to, to take a look at the uh, Facebook group. Maybe Sasha would uh, like to go a little bit more deeper in it. And it is a community project because we, we have like a 24 seven support system uh, integrated on the group. So uh, if anybody I wants- would, I, would, I, would definitely, uh, I would definitely agree to that. I mean, the, the, the ELAP system is designed to complement skill. It's not designed to replace skill, definitely. And you know we have experience with now since the beginning of 2016, so four years. And I can tell you for sure that if I look at the at the ceramists and the dental technicians that have really got the best out of this protocol, that have really done the best with it, and that have presented the best cases with it, these are all, without exceptions, ceramists and technicians that were pretty good at this already before they had an exposure to EVAP. It's just that the eLab brought them to the, the, the final level that you previously couldn't reach. And if you haven't got that sort of full skill set, you know, you're still probably going to improve and you're still going to be a better version of your previous self. But you can't shortcut this experience. You can't shortcut the skill. You can't shortcut the hard work that needs to go into it. it, it it's an aid. It's a tool. And we didn't previously have that. Is it perfect? No, it's far from perfect. But... The point is, it is significantly better than the alternative. When it comes to those shade-sensitive cases, if, if you have an indication for six veneers from K9 to K9, you'll probably make them an A1 or B1. You don't need ELAB for that, right? But in the, in the future market in dentistry where you have more need for smaller interventions, smaller restorations, and they are shade-sensitive, this is where ELAB is without alternative. When it comes to this particular indication not not for your full arch things it's 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 for these intricate uh restorations i can tell you from my own experience and over 25 years in, in dental technology you know this can really ruin relationships i can tell you that for sure this can really really ruin relationships <laughs> you can have a great fantastic relationship with your client for years and it's that one single central that you had to repeat five times or something and can really ruin a relationship so it has a very, very strong uh, socioeconomic aspect to it, very much so. Super. So to sum, it, sum this up, because we, I think we could talk for hours, but uh, the, the idea of this uh, live session is not to have a four-hour lecture sure. on, uh, on, on any topics. But uh, Sasha, you, you just sent me an, uh, an interesting short summarizing video on on the elab and uh, i will run it now and you can maybe live add some comments to this before we do a, a roundup to finish up this very interesting uh, show for tonight and so since since 2006 and since we published the article uh, which showed elab in its raw version uh, we then dedicated a lot of time and energy into simplifying elab and the combination of this is the software here which is the elab prime software so Today, you have the software which does image calibration automatically. You can make mixing recipes for a variety of popular ceramic systems and background materials as well to obtain patient personal shape recipes for the dental lab. Um, and one of, the, one of the most powerful features that the eLab protocol has is the ability to perform a digital try-in. And this is a major advantage for us dental technicians to be able to get a qualitative and a quantitative impression of what the restoration could look like if it was actually clinically tried. And not only that, once you've done the uh, digital trying, you can also quantify the color difference 
and understanding the fundamentals of the C-Lab system, you can work out what the difference is between what you had and what you wanted and also decide interventions as well so you can optimize the result. So this is basically demo technology guided by numbers. And once you have an understanding of how this works, this can then help to improve your restoration and to get really good color matches. This is the clinical result here. And you can even quantify um, the, the, the color match afterwards. And you know, there's a very great congruency between the prediction and the final clinical outcome. You can even do this with uh, reflected images, although polarized images are by far more ideal, uh, ideally suited. So this is everything that happened uh, since then. Uh, it's been a community project, so we also have this web page here called uh, elabprime.com. If you want to know more about elab, there's PDFs to download. There's a bit about our scientific work, lots of tutorials, uh, photographic protocol. If you want to know more about this, just go and visit this web page, and you'll find out everything you need to know about elab. Cool. This was a perfect uh, summary of, uh, of of our discussion. And uh, sh looking at the video, this uh, gives me, let's say, the last question about this indirect and direct uh, restorative dentistry. Because my idea when I downloaded the app was, uh, I do what the, I do this try in, but what, before I do a restoration. So I take the picture. Uh, I have one tooth that is a little bit darker, and then by by analyzing the existing teeth, I, I can, I can uh, get some information what I need to redo this with composite, for example. So Javier, what do you think about uh, these ideas or this, uh, this interpretation of the software? Yeah, it's, uh, th this is the potential. I mean, this is a measurement tool. And, and as they said, the, uh, Sasha and, and, and Panos already, uh, it's a it's a tool for aiding you to to help you you know and uh of course using the mixing recipe of the stains and so on it's it's a it's a the point for it for the for the app for the ceramic but the, the measurement part is still very useful i mean you can always measure and get this information because that's lab values you can you can start using for for your reference and and actually, I was even having conversations with uh, other friends from the group like Agust, and it was funny just to, to know that they were even using uh, the, the recipes also for creating uh, pure Vita shades. I mean, when a doctor was sending the A1, I want an A1. Okay, but you take a picture of your A1 shade tab, and then we make a recipe for that with Elab, and actually it looks closer to, the, to this to this shade up that anything else that, that the manufacturer will provide as a standard. So uh, it can be used in so many ways, but but just doing the color measurement and comparing your, your, your results, even, even if it's just trial error, yeah. uh, when you, you finalize your restoration and you take a picture of the control, and then you can start measuring the tooth color and what, what was the outcome of your restoration. And that already can teach you something, right? Because yeah. you can see that it's, it's a, a little bit too reddish or maybe it's uh, too low luminosity or too high. So you already know that, okay, next time, if I have this kind of color, I will need to use this other enamel instead of this enamel in order to get a little bit higher luminosity here or something else, right? So yeah, this yeah. is- Yeah, this, this, is because this, was my, this was my idea or how I tested Elab Prime in my office, just taking pictures of, of uh, small restorations or a little bit larger restorations, nothing complicated. But just yeah. to learn and to see how my daily daily work performs, and I think this is also what you were talking about: training yourself, try to understand the basics, and then take the next step and uh, and 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 develop further. So uh, because just taking pictures, I tell people take pictures of your work so you can analyze your work. But if you do it like this, I think you have more in deep anal analyzation tools. Uh, to judge your work or to see uh, if you're if you're good with your eyes or with your hands or if you need to improve because you're always completely off off shade maybe you need, you need to <laughs> you need to check your vision so this was also discussion if you're colorblind or not <laughs> yeah. so sometimes these uh, are small things and maybe elab prime can help you to find out that you have a color deficiency uh, we don't know so, but I really want to thank you all. I'm uh, I'm really looking forward in uh, in further developments. The 
the whole live video will be available on all the Facebook groups, on YouTube for further discussion, because I know that a lot of people is not watching live, but watching later, uh, also from different time zones. So I encourage you also to go and uh, and visit and visit uh, our uh, our International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry Facebook group or uh, follow us also on Instagram to get more discussion about this and uh, other topics in the future. So I thank you very much for taking your time from Greece, from, uh, from Germany, from Spain. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, Panos, yes, yes, this is, this is the perfect end screen. <laughs> Wear your face mask and um, hope to see you soon in the real life. But uh, in the meantime, let's, uh, let's stay in this virtual, virtual reality and uh, try to get the most out of uh, dentistry. So take care. Thanks very much. Uh, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for your help. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.